a fantastic chair <laughs> of the um, Activating Spaces panel. It's really lovely to have you all here today. Um, my name is Tracy Sage from Sage Culture Consulting. Um, I'm a cultural strategist and producer. I've overseen a range of festivals and cultural initiatives over the last couple of decades, many of them in the Royal Borough of Greenwich, a lot of them kind of at community level, and then a number of really large scale for the Olympics and tall ships, which, you know, over a million people or so for weekends. So in terms of activating spaces and thinking about place, it's something that I've been really passionate about throughout my career. Um, it's really lovely, actually, that David mentioned when he was talking about those capital projects, he did mention, I think, the Light Nights events. And, you know, a few people mentioned some of the artists on the ground and the creative programs that really do help to activate those spaces, places, you know, make, bring real meaning to the money that's there as well. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today to consider the wealth of creative interventions that my colleagues here have delivered over the, the last couple of years and how they've been used to really activate space and create and celebrate a sense of place and pride for the communities that they work in and with. Um, we have a number of questions to consider, you know, around civic ownership, engagement, creativity, legacy, trust, you know, how you celebrate history and heritage. And I think that the projects we're looking at today really do illustrate that. I'm really pleased to be joined by Fia, who's from Met Metal South End and is a senior project manager for the Estuary Festival. Also by Elaine, who's the arts director at Seven Arts and oversees and knows a lot about the Arches Worcester Festival. Did I say your name correctly? <laughs> <laughs> and Natalie, who's the executive director and joint CEO of Trigger. And then James, who's the strategic lead for culture at North East Link Lincolnshire Council. So I'm going to ask each, everybody, to kind of just give us a little overview of the projects that they've delivered and just talk a bit about what they do. And then we'll go into a kind of general panel discussion again and questions from the floor. So the same with Sarah, if anybody has any questions, if you can signal or raise a hand, and then we'll look and we'll kind of intersperse that with a general conversation here about activating spaces and what that means to the curators, producers, community, and the cre creatives who are involved. So, Thea. Thank you, Tracy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Thea, um, as Tracy has just introduced me. Um, and I'm going to do my best to give you a three minute introduction to uh, a huge uh, festival, uh, Estuary 2021, um, which uh, was. Uh, conceived and initiated by Colette Bailey from Metal in South End, and we've now delivered two editions of the festival. Um, Estuary 2021 was the first of a series of projects uh, supported by Creative Estuary, um, and um, it's important to just point out that the festival was reconceived really during COVID to become an epic walk that took you all around the Thames Estuary coastline and, and on the river as well. And it was inspired by a book by a local author. Um, and uh, presented by Metal in partnership with another arts organisation called Cement Fields. It happened over 23 days. It was across 107 miles at 94 locations in the landscape and with 66 partner venues. We commissioned 265 artists and we had over 200,000 visits made to the festival. In addition, there was a huge online programme, books and publications and an uh, associated programme. I want to briefly cover some of the needs, outcomes and learnings from the festival. This is uh, on the screen, you can see an artwork by an artist called Ruth Ewan. This was presented in pubs along the estuary. And this was really about connecting to the need to connect, raise the profile and celebrate places across the estuary. It was also about redefining the place as a creative place. And it was about using the festival as a means to forge new connections between people, places and ideas. It was about connecting people to the landscape and to, to uh, often overlook stories about the communities who live there. Um, so, yeah, so this artwork was uh, inspired by uh, 
uh, pieces of uh, social justice text um, uh, inspired by the ancient practice of outlining moral principles for rulers. And it was accompanied by um, uh, a series of beer mats. Um, the next need that I want to talk to you about was, uh, was uh, for a grassroots approach. It was particularly important for us to involve local pro people in the process of making the festival happen. So it was about connecting to their lived experiences as well as creating moments of surprise and delight. This is an artwork uh, about the history of waste in the Thames estuary with audio interviews of former waste workers and films showing how the natural environment and waste intermingled with creatures. Um, and so it was really about um, addressing another one of the key aims of the festival, which was to change perceptions and find new ways to connect with the natural world and the more than human world. The next image that I want to show is, um, demonstrates one of the other outcomes of the festival, which was to create new spaces for culture in really unusual spaces. So this is a barn that was reconfigured as a gallery. And in that barn, you can see an artwork that was about microplastics and how they find their way from washing machines into the water in the estuary. And behind that is a series of works about um, the Plotland's history of housing in the estuary. So the, the important thing about this is that this venue is now still there and it's being used. Um, so there's now new infrastructure to support broader cultural and civic, civic uses. Um, I just want to finish up by kind of just, just sharing some of the stats around the festival um, uh, on the next slide, which really shows how a festival can, a large scale festival can successfully contribute towards wider economic ambitions for an area. So this is really about how uh, the festival can catalyze new thinking and change perceptions of places and um, engage the people who live there. And, uh, and also beyond that, uh, kind of successfully attracting people um, to the place. And, and the next, just, so I'm rapidly showing you this within the three minutes. Um, so yeah, it was really uh, um, about attracting people who uh, maybe wouldn't usually visit um, contemporary arts uh, spaces. So we took art out into unusual spaces. We had particularly high numbers of families and children because of a lot of works were presented outdoors in se settings visited by family groups. Um, and the audiences engaged reflected the local communities uh, where the works were presented, um, attracting people least likely to engage with contemporary culture. Um, and the last slide that I want to show you um, is a sculpture by Katrina Palmer, which is proudly flanked by Mario in his swimming trunks. Um, so this was an artwork that was commissioned in partnership with England's Creative Coast. Um, and it was intended to stay in place for six months, um, and it's now still there as a permanent artwork. So I think what's really interesting here is that you have an artwork that has, is commissioned in response to a particular set of ideas and metaphors by the artist, but it's really been embraced and taken on a new life by being owned by the people who live in that particular place, and that that could then creates infinite new surprising conversations. Thank you. I love that idea of um, surprising conversations and also that the idea of ownership, you know, something created by artists and then, you know, held by the community where actually they embrace it so much that they want to see it more and have it again and that it can inspire them as well to think about the future and the legacy of what happens, I think, which is really important. So, Elaine, we're going to move to you and the... Worcester Festivals, the Arches Worcester Festival. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm the arts director at Seven Arts, and Seven Arts is one of four partners that's been involved in delivering the Arches Worcester programme. Uh, I've been uh, fortunate enough, privileged enough to manage the festivals programme in the city, uh, and that's been twofold, partly to support community festivals, to grow their ambition, to upskill them, and to think around legacy and sustainability going forward. But also we've been delivering nine festivals over the last four years, which have ranged from uh, family-focused light nights through to kind of very specific age group co-created um, festivals, uh, which I think we felt there was a very definite need for um, our, a more wider cultural festival for 18 to 30s. So that was, a, a, as I say, a co-created program with that age group. Um, I think our ambition at the start was to be able to give the residents of Worcester uh, an opportunity to see world-class culture on their doorstep and not to be able, have to travel to London, not to have to travel to Birmingham, which is only a, a 
afternoon. Train journey away, it's not that far, but why should people in their own city have to go further afield? Why aren't they entitled to have high-class culture on their doorstep? So that was our main ambition. Uh, we employed a specialist team to deliver the programme, and that ranged right through from an artistic director and to time with our skills development programme, apprenticeships and internships. Uh, what we wanted to try and do was start a, an infrastructure, I guess, so that kind of more graduates would stay in the city as part of this programme. Uh, we, as Adrian alluded to at the start of, the, uh, of the, the presentation, you know, kind of Worcester isn't renowned or wasn't renowned for its festivals. And, you know, would Re Worcester be ready for this programme? I firmly believe that if you don't try, you'll never know. And if you don't try, you'll never change anything. And I think on the first night of our first light night, we were stood in the rain at five o'clock, an hour before it was due to start. And uh, well, it stopped raining. And by 10 past six, the, the, the city was rammed with people. That was four years ago. And we had 6,000 people. We had our light night two weeks ago and 20,000 people turned up. So I think, you know, I think we've proved that the audiences of Worcester are ready. They do want, and they are, <coughs> keen to have more. So for us, I think our, our next stage is how we continue to grow our festivals programme and what that looks like going forward. Thank you. Um, I think that's really interesting, actually. One of the things you brought up there was about bravery. You know, are we brave enough to try something in public spaces? Are we brave enough to do something different, to ignore some of the things that people say? about our place, our space, that maybe won't work, or they'll only go here or only go there, and to just bring something to the community that really does um, inspire us as individuals and that we know will really create a sense of wonder and fill people also with that sense of joy, because that's what part of what creativity is meant to be. You know, you also spoke about the that idea of the skills development, and I think we'll touch on that again later on. But, you know, thinking about that sense of wonder, it's a nice point to hand on to Natalie and the work that you're doing. Thanks, Tracy. Um, yeah, so I am representing Trigger and the Hatchling. Um, I could just see Jason's flicking through the slides. So um, here you can see our beautiful Hatchling. So we were commissioned as part of Mayflower 400, um, funded by Plymouth City Council and Arts Council England to um, present on Bank Holiday um, weekend in August in 2021, the Hatchling. So on um, a Friday afternoon, this egg appeared right in the middle of Plymouth. Um, about the size of a car. No one knew what was going to come out of it. Um, Saturday morning, out pops a baby dragon. So she's the size of a single decker bus and she's curious. She doesn't know where she's going. Um, she's really um, wanting to find out who's in the city and whether they're going to welcome her. Um, and on her journey through Plymouth, she meets different community groups. Saturday night, she finds a place to rest and she's sung to sleep by a live choir and a beautiful lullaby. Um, and then on Sunday morning, she grows full size into an adult walking dragon, which is the one that you saw on the previous slide. <laughs> and then she is really sure of herself at this point. So she's um, trying to find the place in which she's looking for, which is here, the slide that you can see on the hoe. So she's walking up towards the hoe, which is a really iconic um, place in Plymouth, a beautiful um, lighthouse looking over the sea and a really incredible setting. And we chose that as our stage for the finale. So on the hoe on Sunday evening, as the sun was setting, she transformed into a beautiful flying dragon. Her wings were bridled onto her shoulders, so they were 20 meters um, long. And as the sun was setting, she lifted off over the sea to a live sound and light show um, into the distance and flew off over sea and disappeared. It just captivated audiences. So um, we had 30,000 people there on that night watching her take flight. And she took about an hour to fly from Devon to Cornwall. Um, and the council were amazing and um, Arts Council were brilliant, really collaborative um, partners in helping us make this piece of work possible. We worked with a cast of 250 community um, res local residents, 15 um, local groups who all created flash mob performances and happenings for her to 
enjoy on her um, exploration of the city. We had 30 local and national partnerships um, ranging from the University of Plymouth, who I know are here today, um, Rio, who um, Lindsay was a uh, fantastic partner on that project, um, and Theatre Royal Plymouth, lots to kind of name. Um, and then we had a world-class team. So the team was 120 in total, 18 of which were um, from all over. So we had Mervyn Miller, who was the director of puppetry, who was one of the original directors on The War Horse, Carl Robertshaw, who designed The Dragon, who designed sets for Bjork and Ellie Goulding, also a world sport kite champion flyer. And then the remaining uh, 100 or so were all from Plymouth and Devon. So it was really important to us that this piece was a made in Plymouth project. And we really ensured that that happened because of the local partnerships that we formed. And then finally, just on professional and talent development. So that was embedded throughout the whole project. It took three years to create from start to finish and we hosted 40 different paid placements and internships across the project. So they were working on production, costume, lighting, sound design. So we were really feeding the talent pipeline in terms of developing the younger talent in the city who have now all gone on to secure roles. And um, in the previous slides you see here um, is our hatch of leading the cultural celebrations for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee last year. So all of our Plymouth cast came and um, were performing in that show with us. Thank you. Um, I think it's, you know, you can see how all of these projects have inspired a sense of wonder. Um, Hatchling, on, on the website, it says um, about Trigger that you're shape-shifting creatives, that you take people with you, initiating, activating, and nurturing future generations. And I really love that phrase, and actually I love that about everything people are talking about here on the panel today. And so, you know, I want to move on to James and your example in Grimsby as well, which also has world-class art, but very much has community, I think, as well, at the centre of what's happening there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I'm James Charles, I'm Student Lead for Culture at North East Lincolnshire Council. So my role oversees heritage and cultural activity, including the Grimsby Creates Cultural Development Fund programme there. Um, I just wanted to kick off by talking about some of the general principles which was given some thought to over the last 24 hours in terms of what we've, what we've been trying to do using the opportunity of Cultural Development Fund in terms of that real importance of local ownership and local leadership and that opportunity for the local creative sector to build and work together in a, in a trusted way. So again, that opportunity around bringing together new partnerships, people working together who haven't worked together previously, that might be local creatives working, working together. It might be bringing people in from afar, but with local people taking that opportunity and also broadening that conversation out with the local business sector and the voluntary community sector as well. And I think given that we're talking about animating spaces, I think as Annabelle was talking about earlier, her work in St James's Square, which is the major public square in Grimsby Town Centre, really enhanced that as a creative canvas, making the most of that capital investment, but also the time and resource we've spent in terms of building that creative ecosystem, giving people the time and resources to work together. And I think, again, there's, given the language we were talking about earlier, um, in terms of this being a pilot and an opportunity to experiment, some of the things that we've done haven't worked, some things that we've done have worked absolutely brilliantly, but I think the critical success factor is around that engagement and that relevance, balancing all those different needs of different people in the local in the local area. So what have we done with Cultural Development Fund money? We've had a creative programme similar to um, lots of other places. Um, we've, we've had a Festival of the Sea. We've been, uh, as you can see on the, uh, on the, on the slides, um, a, a project called Paint the Town Proud. Again, thinking about our local heritage, what does that mean looking forward as well? We're at centre of the offshore renewables industry with the UK's leading port when it comes to servicing offshore wind. So, and a future looking festival is called Our Future Starts here, delivered by the Culture House. 
Um, again, projection pieces, me and Annabelle might slightly disagree um, in terms of the importance of fish, and that is an, on, an ongoing conversation amongst many stakeholders as to how much we should or shouldn't talk about fish, but we're moving the conversation forward, but we, we, we're working with um, Emergency Exit Art, it's on uh, and I, and a programme called Edible Grimsby, again, bringing that national expertise in, working in the local community sector, working with people that wouldn't necessarily consider that an arts, pro arts project. So, and also working with Magna Vitae on a programme called the Place Power Partnerships. That's a creative Europe funded initiative, four million, a four million euro project. Grimsby is the only place in the country participating in that. So we're now on a stage with places like Lisbon, um, so being part of that international conversation, absolutely vital. Some of the other things which we've been doing to enable this to happen is a support programme which has featured business support, creative networking, go and see visits, people come into Grimsley, see what's happening here, talent development, giving people some time and resource to do research and development projects as well. So again, trying to build that catalyst for things to go forward once Cultural Development Fund finishes. Um, as I've just mentioned, an element um, in in our capital programme was enhancing that public square where Anna Van and Adrian um, were commissioned to uh, deliver those two pieces of work and also build a creative cluster on the dock. So doing all sorts of different things, all driven by the Cultural Development Fund. Thank you. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about the opportunities that the Cultural Development Fund have afforded all of you and all of the areas here as well. And I mean, we've spoken a bit about the artworks, you know, the creative programme. And I'm just wondering if some of you can touch on, you know, the community involvement. You know, how have you been able to bring community along? Or how have your projects reflected the communities that you work with, because I think it's something sometimes when we talk about activating space that we just think, OK, we're just going to bring people out. It's an event. You know, some people in the council see that it's an event and, you know, they're counting the footfall on the day. But really, we know that the projects are far deeper than that, that we want them to have more impact. And we really do want to involve the communities where we're based. So I'm just wondering if you can all talk to that a bit. Can you take that one? Yes. Um, so with the Hatchling, we um, the, the project's all about immigration and migration. So when my creative director and um, partner in crime, Angie, conceived it, it was all around, it was at the height of the Syria uprising and us seeing an increase in um, refugees and asylum seekers coming over to the UK. And she was also at the same time living in China and was really inspired by um, this kite festival and seeing people being brought together by things being in the sky. And also then this iconic um, being of a dragon being really respected in the East, but something to be afraid of in the West. And so we thought that was a really great story for telling people's journeys of how we come to be in Britain and how we are now a multicultural society. And so, and then when you kind of have a meaty theme like that, that's really genuine. And we brought in an academic from the Natural History Museum who helped us design the dragon so that it was really what a dragon would look like. Um, so the Game of Thrones dragon, the tail is too heavy, so that wouldn't actually fly, is what we learned from that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that the, and then the wonder, the sense of wonder that you talk mm -hmm. about, that the hatchling gives, when we went to start working with people in Plymouth, that just totally captured their imaginations. And I think for us, that was the biggest pull. And it was kind of a really easy sell that, something big and magical was going to come to their city for three days, for three whole days that would be free, that they could do anything they liked. And for us, it was important not to come and say, OK, great, this room of Royal Plymouth will have your two youth groups to make a musical. Thanks, see you later. Bye. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to collaborate with them. And we wanted it to be an opportunity where we invited any group, any person to offer something that they felt reflected them and reflected what they do in their community. So we had an over 60s elder tree um, group who did Tai Chi in the park and they just did their class out in the park and the dragon came and interacted and kind of looked. Um, we had life drawing, we had a load of dads and um, sons ride, driving their model boats on a lake. Um, and then we did also have theatre royal youth groups mm. all dressed in yellow and stopping and being a bit of a flash mob. So it was really quite diverse. And I think when you 
come to a, a city and you come with real collaboration at the intent of the source, which is that we invite you to create whatever you feel represents you. That's how then you ensure that different backgrounds come and want to be a part of it. And we really did see everyone represented in the, over that weekend in those 30,000 people. I, th I think that's interesting because you said something there about co-creating and I've been having conversations with people recently about co-creating. What does co-creating mean? Um, I'm running a programme at the moment and everybody keeps saying to me, well, what's going to happen? They want me to tell them the different stages, who's going to be involved, what the different outputs are as we go along, what people are going to do. And I've had to say to them, I have no idea. I've just put an invitation out there and said, this is what we intend to do. But I don't know what's going to happen because actually, if we're going to co-create this, it means I can, you know, bring an initial stimulus. I can offer an invitation, but what happens after that? We have to be brave enough and we have to know that people, groups, organization, the sector is creative enough to join in, you know, to join that call. Um, I'm wondering if any... Uh, just picking up on that, I think for us, our Rising Festival, which was our cultural festival aimed at 18 to 30s, was probably our most challenging from that aspect. Sorry, I have Sorry. to say, no. I looked online and rising and there was also a tattooing strand yes. in there and that sorry I just <laughs> that really got my imagination so please I didn't mean to interrupt no, you but I just had to say that for me young people I thought okay the young people were really involved in this <laughs> and, and that's exactly what I was going to go on and say because I think we felt that the you know in terms of a cultural need within the city there are lots of different art forms that are catered for but there is probably an, an area of culture in the broadest sense of the word that some young people feel isn't within our city um, as Jabba alluded to earlier it's a city of, of heritage and how do we make sure that young people in our city feel that this city is also for them um, so we brought together a group of 18 to 30 young adults and again it's that what are you going to do? Well, we don't know because we are working with this group to enable them to think bigger, to enable them to think more ambitiously. And they did come up with three, uh, three strands, kind of fashion, tattooing and gaming, most of which is, you know, totally relevant to, a, to some young, people, young adults. Um, I think the challenge around co-creation is, you know, you know what you know, so how do, as a facilitator, you enable people to think differently about those areas? So kind of, you know, we did have a tattooing exhibition and that exhibition was very much rooted in the local community. We invited people with tattoos to come forward and tell their stories of the tattoos behind, of the, why they had those tattoos. And we had an exhibition down at the Arches around that. On the other hand, we also had an academic talking about the history of tattooing and why that was important in terms of our cultural references. So we wanted to try and enable those young people to think a little bit broader probably than then maybe they thought they could because otherwise how do you push those boundaries? Um, but for us that whole kind of co-creation and that enabling that group to think around why they want to stay in the city and where those gaps are in the city was was really relevant to, to our program yeah thank you for that i think it is really interesting and it does talk about that idea for some of us of bravery you know i remember when my son had said he wanted to have a tattoo and just all that happened with me you know thinking about it and so i know that as commissioners sometimes that you do think oh but then you really have to trust um, I'm interested in hearing a bit about the Grimsby example, actually, as well. Yeah, I was going to uh, talk about, um, as, as part of Festival of the Sea um, last year, um, we, we worked with the people behind the children's ITV programme, Dave Spud. So Dave Spud is a fictional character in a fictional Grimsby, um, vo uh, voiced by... Johnny Vegas, um, broad appeal for that is primary school, primary school kids. Um, but as part, as part of the festival, they came in, worked with um, a couple of local schools and made a, a special short film called Where Do All The Boats Go? Um, so the opportunity for people to work with internationally award-winning uh, animators coming to the local school creating 
a piece which has now been seen by 67,000 people on, on YouTube. So again, that kind of engagement with, with children and young people and talking about the history and also the future of, of the port and of the town in a, in, in, a, in a different way. And again, it's part of that opportunity to experiment and do things in a, in a slightly different way because there's the, the ongoing tension, I think probably as has been referenced in Worcester and probably almost everywhere in terms of a default to looking backwards, but what does that mean if, you, if you've if been born in the last 40 odd years, the fishing industry is a generation or two or even three generations away, but also how do we reflect that and also look forward? So I think again, coming out of COVID, it gave us an opportunity to do things a little bit differently. And I think the fundamental benefit of that is around civic pride. And I know that's not necessarily direct link into a space, but it's, it's making sure that people have that sense of ownership and confidence about being able to look forward in the future. I think civic pride really is something about space, actually. There's something about when you activate space, who do you activate it for? You know, there are members of the community sometimes who we talk about who are excluded or that we know don't necessarily feel comfortable in certain spaces or places, maybe at different times of day or, you know, certain places where we just don't see sectors of the community going. And that's also about a sense of ownership and civic pride, people understanding why place and space is relevant to them. And sometimes through culture and creativity, we're able to tell a story of the history and heritage of the place or reimagine different stories that become relevant to people so that they can see things differently. Um, I'm also interested in the estuary example. You know, how do you activate a place or space and think about the landscape? You know, you spoke about the park and I'm aware of the, the river that runs, you know, through the, the two sides of where the estuary takes place. And so that idea of landscape, of nature, of water, of greenery is very apparent in a lot of people's lives and I think played a key part in terms of the creativity that the artist expressed. But, you know, how were you able to, to get people to interact with that or did it just happen? I think what was, what was, what was really interesting about Estuary Festival is and, and I want to give an example about one of the uh, uh, participation projects um, that, uh, that really gives an example about how arts and culture can um, enable people to develop a, a deep and nuanced relationship with their immediate place, um, yet also find connections with people who maybe they're separated from through a stretch of water, for example, and actually understanding that some of their lived experiences are not, they're not alone in that. And I think, so the, the participation project that we ran was called The Water Replies, uh, where uh, anybody living in the estuary was invited to keep a journal and they could keep it in any format they wanted to that described what life was like in the estuary. And then we found ways to bring those people together to have conversations about the, the things that they shared in their journals and then to, to pull out some of those bits of text and, and put them in unusual places so that they then re reached a wider audience. So I think that's where there's real power in, in kind of that kind of element of participation. And, and I think having social engagement is, has to be at the heart of everything and how that ma manifests itself will be very different in different scenarios. So it could be about being very much artist-led and ensuring that the artist has, has as much access to conversations with local people because you have to trust in that process as well of the artist being able to come up with a, a different way of looking at, at these sorts of issues. I think trust comes up a lot, doesn't it, in whatever we're doing when we're talking about this. I'm not sure if anybody has any questions from the floor at the moment. So, oh, yes. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Chris Ashman from the Isle of Wight Council. Um, two questions, if I might, Chair. Um, really, really impressive events. Um, my first question is about sustainability um, and funding of these these types of activities going forward. I know our colleague from Groomsby touched on it in his remarks, 
but obviously raising expectations and obviously stimulating um, the communities that you've all done. If you if you, you have a risk then of obviously things returning to the way they were before because the money's not there anymore. So just reflection from each of them, each of the panelists on that. And the second one really is about evaluation. Um, we're obviously part of the round two projects and we're learning from the um, evaluation framework that was put together for, for round one. And I, I have to say it's a bit of a painful exercise in terms of the numbers and indicators that are, that are being touted at the moment. Um, but that, be, that, that aside, would, um, would each of the panel members be able to tell us what they felt the most significant impact of their project was? Um, that was potentially not captured by a number on the spreadsheet. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that the first question is something, the, the importance, which ties back to what I think David had mentioned about the capital funding, really, the importance of revenue funding um, for these projects to actually be delivered and what that means for the community, for the long-term sort of sustainability that's going to happen afterwards. So it'd be great if all of you could touch on that first of all, and then we'll come to the second question. You want me to start and we'll yes. go down the line? Um, so in terms of sustainability, this is more of a point about revenue projects than capital projects. Um, so initially, what we were going to do was have an annual festival, um, in, in theory, um, one, one each year over three years. Um, due to COVID, that didn't happen, but it was also a good opportunity to reconsider exactly how it was all going to work. Because basically, North, North East Lincolnshire is a priority place for Arts Council. It's an area of focus for National Lottery Heritage Fund. So over, over the years, there hadn't been much money spent on cultural and heritage activity. And to go to make a really big leap in terms of the size and scale that had been delivered previously, up to trying to get to a sustainable model for uh, for festivals at quite a size, felt like quite quite a leap and too big a leap to make. So we changed our delivery model and have moved more into smaller activities and supporting fledgling, emerging, whatever term you want to use, creative practitioners and artists to make sure it is not the council doing everything in the future because A, we're not the best organisation to do it and, and B, that gives a plurality in terms of different people doing different things. So again, I think it's making it sound a little bit like we're on the X Factor. Like kind of, it's all about the journey and making, <laughs> and making sure that it's the right journey for the place and don't try and leap. Because I think initially we were trying to make a leap that was, that was too big. And to answer your second question, um, the thing which is really, really hard to evidence, if not impossible to evidence, is around genuine collaboration and people coming together, people, um, colleagues from the Cultural Development Fund Network have been to Grimsby, other stakeholders have, have been as well, and there's a genuineness of people working together, quite how you write down, everyone wants to work together. They might have said that three years ago, but in reality, was that actually happening? But to kind of quantify and qualify those that sort of journey and genuine building things up from the ground and those new collaborations and partnerships coming together quite how you write that in a spreadsheet um, is something we haven't quite quantified but you can make those qualitative statements around progression and support okay i'm going to push you a bit and all of you so in terms of that question about delivering something for the community and you're delivering it with the community and with the artists, with the creatives, almost raising an expectation. So where are you now, you know, coming to the end of that funding? Is there money available? And do you know if some of those projects are continuing going forward? Is that for me? Yes, but all of you, okay. <laughs> as a part of your answer. Um... 
So, as was referenced a little bit earlier, we are trying to be clever with UK Share Prosperity Fund, using that as match funding for Arts Council bids, Heritage Fund bids, but also but kind of doing that at a council-wide level for us to be an enabler, but also, again, how do we broaden that, that, that going out? So yes, there is a raised expectation. Yes, I've written lots of Arts Council bids. Yes, there are more Arts Council bids to be written in the next few weeks. Um, so, uh, so will will this sort of activity be truly sustainable without um, public sector subsidy? No. Are there raised expectations? Yes. Has over the have over the years previously? This, has there been sufficient investment? No. Is there now a climate and a culture of wanting to invest yes. yes and again it's a bit part of that building that evidence base as we referenced earlier yeah thank you i think it, it's good for colleagues to know where you are now you know you've gone through the process so for them to have received they're receiving funding and to think about well what do you do as you're coming to the end because we are in a very different climate mm. to the one that we were three or four years ago so I just think it's good for them to know yeah. this is where I, you are at the moment. Actually, you're fundraising mm -hmm. at the same time as well. And I think it was important that you mentioned for yours, you've done lots of smaller projects as well, which are embedded within the community. So hopefully some of those can continue without, you know, the council having to push. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the community will also push for some of that funding to say this is important to us. Um, yeah, so I guess on the funding point, we um, we were very fortunate to be commissioned as part of um, Plymouth City Council and Arts Council's um, wider uh, CDF bid. And so um, I think they were totally obviously captured by the hatchling. But for us, that that meant that we were part of this bigger anniversary year. And going forwards, we knew what we were creating. And this ties in with the sustainability of um, your question. We built it with sustainability and um, touring, future touring in mind. So she packs down into two shipping containers. Um, she can very easily go on the back of two Arctic lorries. Um, so we took her, she's already had one outing at the Queen's Platinum Jubilee in London. Um, she, fingers crossed, is hopefully gonna be greenlit very soon to go um, and be presented next year somewhere in the UK, um, which I can't uh, reveal just yet, but keep an eye out on our website um, and that will be the full show. So it'll be really, really spectacular. Um, so sustainability, we kind of built the hatchling and fabricated it with future touring and um, a longer life in mind. And I think for us at Trigger in terms of funding, we are a non-venue based organization we make memorable, large-scale, spectacular works. And so where we position ourselves is strategically with big anniversary years, City of Culture. Um, we were one of the 10 lead um, commissions as part of Unboxed last year with Pollinations, which was a multi-million pound project through DCMS. Um, so we, as an organisation, are constantly approached by councils and local authorities to make different works. But I think where we kind of position ourselves is within the big larger scale because that's where we can really pack a punch and have that impact and then just finally on the evaluation I think the, the thing that we've taken away from the hatchling is there's lots of things in terms of stats we actually um, uh, our evaluation captured how we collaborated with our stakeholders and partners so um, applied automation we're a family our family run business in Plymouth um, and they make um, AI pieces for Formula One cars and aeroplanes, but they gave us 8,000 square feet of fabrication space. So we brought our fabricators in there and they let us build in there for 12 months. And they were just really passionate that the, at the fact that it was gonna be built in their workshop and there was a collaboration between their guys on the floors and our people on the floor. And it was doing good for their business. So the, bit, the director told me that they had secured more business in America because they were seen to be doing good and that they were helping charities and specifically this piece of work. Thank you. I think that's interesting. You know, when you think about the panel that we've got two kind of local authorities um, councils here so it's a different perspective to organizations who've been commissioned but it's nice to hear that those commissions 
are leading to more work, um, deeper partnerships, the possibility of you know, expanding and developing practice. So all those ideas of skills development happen at different levels, from pe entry level into people who are more established in the sector and established and delivering work in different ways. So did you have anything? Yeah. Um, um, so I think in terms of sustainability, uh, because we've got two parts of our festivals programme, I think the community festivals, some of that will happen automatically through the skills development and the, the work we've done to support them. And the city council have put some additional funding in next year to help continue to support those. I think what's more challenging, as James says, is that without public subsidy, the larger scale festivals just don't happen. Uh, I think it's probably a really good question for the policymakers in the room, how if policies change over the course of a project. So obviously I assume Worcester was an area of need when Cultural Development Fund was issued. We aren't a priority place. We aren't a levelling up place. So how do we sustain ourselves is a good question. Um, uh, we did apply for MPO uh, we, for the festivals programme. We were told it was a strong application, but again, not really in the right area of the country. So it's a challenge for us. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not going to basically try and dress that into something, something it isn't. So, but we have raised expectations. We have raised audiences' needs. So you know, we are determined that some parts of the programme will continue, um, but it will be a challenge to raise those sorts of funds. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that it is important to realise that these are not easy times for any of us and not easy, you know, and the decisions aren't easy either and that what comes out of the projects at the end will be very different depending on the regions, depending on the finance available, depending on the decisions made by, you know, the decision makers, by the people with the money, the funding and the fa finance. And so whilst it is something we can consider and that we try and, you know, we try and make sure we put things in place, really sometimes a decision isn't down to, to, to you or to us. Um, so, and you can't stop yourself. You know, we had that discussion before about being brave and trusting the process. You know, and, and maybe it is really disappointing for some of the communities if you did something big and wonderful and you can't do it again. But what would it have been like if it didn't happen? If you hadn't stirred that sense of wonder and imagination into your local communities? And I think that that's what's really important about the funding that comes and about the commitment, you know, of colleagues to try and push and find another way as well. And just on the evaluation question, I think the thing that you can't get on a spreadsheet is impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so finding another way of capturing that. I mean, we've used quite a lot of film. James is here today. <laughs> He's made some wonderful films. Um, and I think Jabba's going to talk a little bit about that in the next panel. But the impact on people's lives through some of this is, is, has been quite moving. And I think that's a really, you need to find a way of capturing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, on sustainability, I think um, it's the sort of tension between the urgency to drive change and balanced against the sort of um, the tenacity that's needed in order to build these ecosystems. So in the estuary, there is a, a lack of cultural infrastructure in a lot of the places where the festival was working. So to kind of return to the journey analogy, it's like, you know, you kind of, you, you get the car so far, but then it runs out of petrol and that's really the worst thing that can happen because then you just have to go back to square one again. Mm -hmm. So it's really about making sure that the good work can be sustained and it is, you know, it is a challenge to, to make that happen. But I think we have to, we owe it to the places that we work to, to find a way to do that because they're the ones that are going to, the people living in those places are going to suffer if it doesn't happen. Um, and um, on the question around evaluation, I completely agree with what Elaine said. It's about telling the stories through that data. That is the thing that's really powerful and to make sure that you find a way of doing that and, yeah, make sure you allocate a lot of time for it, more than you think. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just aware of time now, so we're just down to the final few minutes. I think that... 
I'm just going to ask all of you if there's one key takeaway or call to action, um, something positive that you'd like colleagues to know um, from your experience and as they go forward in their own, what would that be? What is the kind of positive gem or call to action that you'd like to leave people with? I think I think the really important thing from my my perspective, from women's perspective, is at the beginning we thought we knew some of the answers, whether we did or not, is being defined as we've gone gone along the process. So I think the important takeaway is that is that fle flexibility building that trust with, with funders, building that trust with the local creative sector, and having the opportunity to flex things along along the way. So I think that's the, the critical takeaway from me, setting those foundations, thinking about those outcomes, but the way you get to those outcomes might be a very winding path, and we should all go along different paths. Thank you. Um, there's loads, but I think for me, and I'm just going to fly the flag for the arts and culture sector, but we've seen there's a massive talent drain um, in terms of technical and creative teams. And I think it's so important that we embed placements, higher education, institution partnerships within all of our projects. So in Plymouth, we had 40 placements that worked um, from start to the finish. Um, 36 puppeteers in total, eight of those were from the University of Plymouth. We um, took part in a pilot, which Chris Benoith, who's here speaking later, he was instrumental in um, creating that pilot, which basically meant that we hosted an MA on the course, um, on the project. Um, and I, I think it's just developing local talent so that they feel like they have that pride in place and that connectedness to them. I think that's important, that idea as well of developing local talent, recognising the talent that exists and using that to inspire another generation or create opportunities for creatives who already have a practice that can expand what they're doing. I think for me, so don't under underestimate the time it takes to build trust with some of the communities you're working with. It's not a quick fix and just make sure that you're kind of uh, talking to them, listening to them and um, working with them rather than to them. Thank you thing that I'd like to say which is that it's really important that culture is part of the conversation outside of the sector so that we can speak to people who are working in housing in the environment to to speak about the role that culture can play in helping addressing some broader issues um, and I'd also just like to say how great today is and the importance of knowledge exchange both like on our in our hyper local areas and, and at, the, at different scales as well and and whether we can look further outside to see what else is going on and bring that back. I'd really like to see more of that happening. Thank you. I really want to thank all of the members of the panel here. And I think that we've come full circle again to Aristotle's rhetorical triangle. Um, funnily enough, you know, tell compelling stories, um, develop close relationships and partnerships, woo people. And in our case, you know, with the communities that we work with, make sure that they are also enabled to woo us as a part of this and develop an evidence base. So I just want to say thank you to everybody here and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>